Hello. Welcome to Season XV of The Horrific Podcast. We're two friends who live in different places but share a love for scary movies. In each episode, we both watch the same movie on our own and then record a conversation together about what we liked, what we hated, if we were scared, and maybe even some larger truths about why people watch horror movies in the first place. This season, we're watching movies from the 90s and talking about how they fit into the larger picture of 90s horror and how each year from that decade stacks up against the others. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Funny how time goes on, and we just keep finding ourselves right back here. It's like the bad guy in It Follows. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like sometimes we we get a little bit ahead, mm-hmm. and then eventually it just catches back up, and then we got to get fucked, or else we, <laughs> or else it's just not gonna stop. Yeah, that's the only way we can pass it pass the burden on to someone else. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe we get time to bang in a new host. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we are here uh, to kick off season sixteen. Season XV is officially behind us. And we're excited to start something new. And I actually kind of had a lot of fun getting ready for this season. I did too. I'm actually still in get ready mode for this season, meaning all my recommendations are this and I'm just in heaven. (laughs) Right. I'm just in heaven. You're like immersing yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah, Getting ready. I like it. It's like four or five of these movies a night. (laughs) <laughs> because some of them are short but it's yeah it's great love it yeah so for the kickoff we're going to go through a few different things we're going to start off talking about some of the stuff we've been doing since we wrapped up recording season xv uh because that was spoiler warning longer than a week ago and then we're going to talk about some things that are going on in horror right now And then that's going to lead us into talking about what we'll be doing for season 16 specifically. So to start off with what we've been doing, we wrapped up recording for season XV, what, probably four weeks ago. Yeah. And Um, edited the episodes, got them out and scheduled and ready, and then just took a little bit of a break. I know for me this year had kind of a rough start. So lots of travel and unpredictable scheduling and, family members and hospitals and funerals and all that stuff. And we just decided to really like power through those last several episodes to get a little bit of a backlog going so that we could kind of wrap things up in personal lives and then also take a very much needed break. Yeah. And during that break, we finally had our cabin weekend. We did. Yeah. That was a good weekend, man. It was. It was uh, very, very much needed. And I really enjoyed getting some time away and for us to just to like catch up and hang out in person. Because mm-hmm. now that my parents don't live where you live anymore, it's harder to just kind of build in like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be in town for a week. Like, let's get together. Yeah. It's more. All right. Well, while I'm visiting them, I'm going to commute. <laughs> and yeah. then we can have dinner or something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that, that was a really good time. And we watched actually a lot of movies. <laughs> we did. It just makes sense. Like, cause yeah. we got, so we got the cabin and it was on water, but it was also like 50 degrees out. It felt like most and days windy. and windy, which is fine anyway. Cause like we kind of plan like, all right, we're just going to stay in and get drunk. <laughs> it worked, but it, you know, so what else are you going to do other than play music and, and watch movies? Yeah, which is kind of just like a distillation of our whole friendship. Oh, so so great. Yeah. It was a very, very fun time, and I'm glad we were both able to make it happen this time around. And I literally gained eight pounds, and it was <laughs> like, it's not like we were eating a lot, but right. it was from the cores that I was drinking. Yes, I, the cores heavy. Yeah. The cores heavy, man. I refused to drink anything light for that, and, and <laughs> then I had... A, technically two doctor's appointments since then and, <laughs> and each is just a constant reminder and then, yeah i was just like oh shit i wasn't eating a ton there it yeah <laughs> how much <laughs> cores i was drinking they catch up with you oh god but yeah 
Yeah, we had a really good time. Uh, we watched a lot of movies, and one of those movies that we watched was Weenie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Yes. And I didn't realize, this was the thing you brought to my attention, mm. is that that's like a whole thing. Yeah. Or it's going to be, yeah. What, what do they call it? The um, Oh, the Twisted Childhood Universe is what they're calling it. Oh, okay. Interesting. Twisted Childhood Universe. Yeah. Um, they plan on doing Bambi, Peter Pan, Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles for sure. Like it was like when I was reading this at the cabin, I think I already had a couple of beers in me and like I was kind of mad because I was like, <laughs> you're just attacking things I love. I think yeah. we would chat about, I was like, I feel like people just get off on ruining things that I like. Yeah. Like it's just, you like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I'm going to ruin it for you. Yeah. Well, it, it was interesting to me because I didn't realize that Weenie the Pooh, Blood and Honey had been like a financial success because yeah. critically it just got blasted and its ratings everywhere are in like the single digits out of a hundred. Uh, but obviously like we needed to watch it. And so I'd been waiting till we could do that together. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't think it was a great movie, but I didn't think it was quite as bad as uh, some of the, the reviews have made it out to be, but it turns out most people actually seem to have liked it a lot more than I did because a ton of people saw it. <laughs> and then I was doing some reading and confirmed upcoming movies are Weenie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2, Bambi the Reckoning, Peter Pan's Neverland Nightmare, mm-hmm. and The Little Mermaid, but yeah. like a horror version of The Little Mermaid. So yeah. those are all real things that are going to happen. And it, it really reminds me a ton of after the Halloween requel came out. And then all of a sudden we had kind of the same formula oh, being yeah. applied to other stuff, yeah. you know, yeah. that it's like, we're just riding that trend again. Like there was a horror movie that came out that had a novel concept and it made a ton of money at the box office. And now everybody's just like, well, that's a formula I can recreate. <laughs> and right. So to me, it's funny too, just because we just got done in season XV talking about how, you know, the nineties are sort of maligned for, uh, you know, cheap sequels, low budget sequels with no content mm-hmm. and just following the formula and trying to cash in and make an easy buck. And it's like, man, you can say that about any decade. Like <laughs> anytime right. a movie right. comes out that makes money, people are going to start copying it. And that's just the way it works. Yeah. Yeah, and you know that even kind of comes up in this uh, this next season, season sixteen that we're we're doing. But yeah, are are any of those upcoming ones ones that you're particularly interested in? Mm, so I'm going to say no, based on not the fact that I love Peter Pan, which was like my one of my childhood favorites, uh, just based off of Blood and Honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the be way that. that so as I look through this list, I'm like, will I pay money for a movie ticket to see any of these? Oh, that's true. Very unlikely. Yeah. Will I eventually watch all of these when they're available for streaming? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah. Yeah. So maybe maybe we can do a future season that's all uh, remade horror versions of like childhood movies. Yeah. yeah, I definitely wouldn't. I wouldn't pay other than my monthly streaming. But yeah. But that's not just for this. You get other stuff out of that too. So, yeah. But anyway, kind of the the other side of all this, um, as we continue, we, you know, we've clearly transitioned into the part of the show where we're talking about trends in horror now. Something that has come up a lot recently, and this really wasn't a term I heard before, really like when Get Out came out, is this concept of elevated horror. I don't really like that term but we can kind of get into the reasoning for that more once we kind of get into what it is but i have heard the term thrown around a lot and to be honest like i kind of had a feel for what it was but for this episode i wanted to go back and find something that explained it better than i would have and i found an article on gamerant.com called 10 best elevated horror movies ranked that i feel like in the intro just summed it up super well so here we go Horror movies have been a mixed bag in terms of critical reception over the years, with everything from trashy slasher flicks to truly ingenious, critically beloved films being part of the huge genre that has often been thought of by some moviegoers as being only good for a quick scare. However, elevated horror, 
is a relatively new shift away from the genre standard. Instead of being expressly created to inspire fear in audiences, elevated horror movies aim to challenge the viewers and make them think, often presenting social commentary in among the scenes. Elevated horror films are often praised by critics, and several of them have been named among the greatest horror movies of the 21st century. So think about like Get Out and Midsommar and The Killing of a Sacred Deer. I'm not arguing that these aren't good movies, but I don't like the term elevated because I think the whole history of horror movies has been doing exactly what these movies do. Yeah. Like, they talked about, you know, the presenting social commentary and, you know, doing creative things that critics appreciate. Like, horror movies have kind of always done that. It's like the specialty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, that's the thing we like about them, you know, it is, you know, because we talk a lot about there are basically like two types of movies or two things that movie makers try to do with horror. One is to scare the audience, which is kind of an absurd thing if you think about it. Like, like how creative do you have to be to make me feel uncomfortable, which is what I try all day not to do. Mm -hmm. While I'm sitting in some place super comfortable eating popcorn and in the air conditioning. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the Mm -hmm. idea that you can figure out a way to create film that makes me feel ways that I try my best not to feel all day long is kind of an absurd premise. And that's what makes it so interesting. And the other thing they do is use all these horror elements to like tell a story or make a larger point and then drive them home in a creative way where they're using sort of the fear to help guide you along the journey of making that point. So basically I feel like horror movies, like, yes, there have always been low budget horror movies, but I don't think like there was a time where there was just nothing but trash horror movies. And then all of a sudden recently they got better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's almost like a little difficult with that with that term because it's like they yeah so basically I feel like it's like they like I don't think Jordan Peele came out and was like I'm gonna make an elevated horror I think that these people were just making horror movies and and a lot of stuff with art is just like what's relevant and and you know and current situations of life or politics or whatever and it's it's um you can be fed off of and it's almost like they just like well we're gonna group all these movies in together and call them elevated it's like well okay but they've just been doing it so it's it's almost like a null point it's almost yeah. like you, they're just needing to get their name in the hat of like hey we coined a phrase mm-hmm. um but Like, I don't know if, like, elevated horror would ever be, like, on, like, the, like, a genre list, like, when we were doing, like, our (laughs) monsters. Like, I don't, I don't know, but maybe. I think it's just because it's difficult to tell because it's, those are just so entwined over the hundred years of horror that we've had. What? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and also, we just came off a season where we talked about how the decade that was like most accused for kind of the low budget trashy movies had a ton of really good, well-made, interesting, challenging, creative, and totally worthwhile horror movies. So Mm -hmm. it frustrates me a little bit that there's this idea of like, Oh yes, we've emerged from this dark age of horror being only lowbrow into the glorious new standard of horror movies or something. And also to i guess talk about even the maybe trashier horror movies is almost being like worthless because like people have loved this genre for like a hundred years at this point Mm -hmm. because of all the things it's able to do not just because of kind of the lower end of it i think that there may be as far as the this idea of like this renaissance of sort of elevated horror in the 2010s i think that it's gotten cheaper to make movies that look better oh and and i think that there have also been some production companies 
like Blumhouse and like A24 distribution that have made some of these movies more accessible in Mm -hmm. sort of a more like independent way. And so I think there's a lot of factors going on with why we have this idea and all these think pieces about elevated horror. But what I guess what I don't like is the idea that movies that are made for more of that market or trying to be horror that way or somehow like more valid or inherently better than any other work of horror because horror is an established genre and genres last for a reason and they tap into something that people can relate to and like and you and I have always kind of been against the grain a little bit yeah (laughs) we've always kind of done our own thing a little bit yeah yeah. yeah. And this season, after reading articles about elevated horror, we decided we're not going to talk about any of that this season. We're going to double down on unelevated horror, in fact. And the theme of season 16 is officially B movies for C students. Oh, yeah, boy. The greatest title of a season of all time. You know what? Every horror TV. I'm talking podcast. This is the greatest (laughs) title of all time. (laughs) You know what? Every horror movie doesn't need to be some philosophical elevated work of independent film. You're goddamn right. You know what I mean? Like I, I appreciate diversity in the films. I like that horror is a genre that spans a lot of stuff. But you know what? I'm tired of people crapping on good old fashioned genre horror movies. And we're going to take a season to look at those. You're damn right we are. Listen, you came up with this idea. I saw the title of what we should call it. And you're like, maybe something. And I was like, I'm in just from the title alone. And then when I read what it was, I was like, no, this is, this is, this is, we should also just AKA the season for Bryce. Like that should be it (laughs) because it's just been, listen, I started doing research for this and ended up out of horror B movies and just like, I'm just in B movies only. And Oh dude, so many boobies. (laughs) (laughs) So many. I I was going to say, we're about to spend a lot of time on Tubi, but you went in a slightly different direction. (laughs) Well, I was fixing to say, and Tubi is where you go for it. Cause I've only been watching, I've only been using Tubi lately. Uh, Yeah. And it's it's strictly because they do have a ton of like these one off type movies, but yeah. It, yeah, it's so great. But yeah. So when I say B movie, what comes to mind for you? So I guess like the initial thought when I hear B anything is like the B side of an album, just because yeah. music's usually my my first thought. So it's like yeah, we had our single. And then, you know, on the flip side, it was, you know, insert whatever song. And um, so I guess I generally think maybe less production time spent um, or maybe like you didn't have the funds to like do the production for both. Uh, I also think it's like resourceful. That's one of the things I kind of think of because in my opinion, I don't like to waste a ton uh and so the thought is like, Hey, we have a whole, just yet again, keeping it on like the out, you know, vinyl music kind of explanation. Like, Hey, we have a whole other side that we could just put another single on another song. How do you want to do it? And it's like, yeah, we should do that. That makes more sense and more exposure. But uh, yeah, I think it's like resourceful. I think that it is. S- so initially before research, my opinion was like, Oh, it's just cheapo depot films. that are just kind of slow. You just put together and you know, not much care or thought is put out there. And then that's it. And that's just the movie, you know, it's just like, let's just put something out there to make some quick, quick money. Technically it's not wrong. However, it's so much more than what I thought. Yeah. You know, like I thought this was like, oh, let's just watch some gnarly, like B horror movies. I'm totally in a hundred percent of the time. And then I was like, oh no, there's like actual like science behind <laughs> behind this. <laughs> yeah, I definitely w- when I would say B movies to start with, I mostly would just mean like low budget and probably kind of outside the Hollywood system. Yeah, so like probably didn't work with a big production company. Probably a lot of DIY. Probably not great acting. 
because you you know the good actors for the most part can get work on films with better budgets and so in my mind it was just very much like a kind of no rules do it yourself kind of punk rock version of movie making and yeah low budget i think was really like how i just would have defined it to start with but as i started doing some more investigation i found that there really is like a much richer history and so i found an article called b movies a brief history by ken robin show on a website called picture showman.com and i figured i'd just read the beginning of this because most people hate reading uh but i thought it was really interesting so it When the Great Depression enveloped the country, theater admissions fell by a third, and many of the 23,000 movie theaters that existed in 1930, from neighborhood houses to deluxers, were forced to close their doors. The ones that survived experimented with a galaxy of appetizers to attract audiences, from offering prizes that ranged from dishes and hams and automobiles, to including stage shows and vaudeville acts as part of the evening's entertainment. However, when small-time vaudeville lost its effectiveness, movie theaters experimented with two-for-one tickets and free ladies' matinees. But in the end, the exhibition feature that made the greatest impact on the industry was the double feature, which means showing two movies for the price of one. Although this was not a new business strategy for the theaters, having been used in the past whenever income lagged, it now became an almost universal practice. By 1935, 85% of American motion picture theaters were programming double features. A typical bill at this time lasted three hours or more and included two features, cartoons, a newsreel, and previews of coming attractions. The big five Hollywood studios, each of which owned a theater chain at this time, found it especially difficult to satisfy the seemingly insatiable appetite of their theaters for new product. The solution they found was to supply a prestige, big-budget film with a second, inexpensive feature. The big-budget film, the A movie, placed at the top of the marquee, would pull in audiences by using major stars, quality scripts, and high production values. The second feature, the budget B movie, was an entertaining but quickly made shorter film that usually used a studio's standing sets revolved around a formulaic plot and fit into an identifiable, easy-to-make genre such as Western comedy, gangster, newspaper, detective, college, medical, or jungle film, and eventually included horror and film noir. Often called cheapies, quickies, low-budget, or simply budget films, from the early 1930s to the early 1950s, these B-movies played an important role in Hollywood, and roughly 75% of the pictures made during the 1930s alone, well over 4,000 films, are considered to be in this category. So it was interesting to me because I I think when we think B-movie, we think kind of appealing to people's baser instincts. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that was really the case in the beginning. I think in the beginning, it was really more a way of trying to figure out how to create an entertaining entertaining movie with a lower budget and production value. And we've talked before about some of the best horror movies. They don't require a big budget or really crazy special effects. They just re- require movie makers who know how to use what resources they have effectively. And some of the best, most creative things can come from people who really know how to creatively work within their limitations. And so I feel like this is almost kind of a perfect setup for that. It's almost like a challenge, like given these constraints, what's the best you can do? And then like let human creativity do what it can come up with. And I think you get really cool results and also really terrible results of that generally, but the outcome is bound to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and so I actually have a little uh, thing I wanted to read too, because it kind of pertains to like the, I guess the DIY ness maybe a little bit. But as the cost of film productions rose during the 1940s, the major studios began to abandon B units. Several small studios, including Republic and Monogram, stepped in to fulfill the need for low budget movies. So like by the forties, it's already because of like what you're just saying with all the movies that they're pushing out, like it's, there's a need for it It, by the forties. They, they stepped in to fulfill the low budget movie role. Those studios collectively were known as poverty row grow, uh, 
Gower Gulch or the Beehive, uh, which I thought the Beehive was dope. That's funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the bee film further declined after 1948 when the U.S. Supreme Court issued a paramount uh, decrees uh, which prohibited restrictive booking practices and forced the major studios to sell their theaters, restricting along with uh, or, sorry, restructuring, restructuring along with competition from television uh, and changes in taste resulted in the demise of the double bill. However, there was still a need for these B movies. Like by this time, people wanted them, people needed them. Um, low budget films productions in uh, did not cease. However, studios such as American international pictures emerged during the 1950s to offer cheaply produced exploit exploitation movies which were targeted to a specific audience or low rent exhibitors these films which were not necessarily exhibited with a picture were also dubbed b films uh it was at this juncture that the term b movie became equated to uh, with shoddy production values and poor quality filmmaking so initially it started out with being like hey we need to make some money. All these theaters are shutting down in the United States. Uh, and you know who owns the theaters, the production companies? Yeah. Uh, right. so U.S. Supreme Court stepped in and were like, yo, you can't do both. Apparently, them people making money was a bad thing. And, uh, and then that kind of sparked what I think we see as current day B-horror movies. Because all yeah. I kept seeing was like fifty, like from fifty to eighty six was like the the lifetime of when B movies existed, and so that's just like when when we were starting this, that's all I was thinking of. And then uh, I th- maybe it was your article, and I was re- I was like, or maybe we were going through the list, and I was like, no, they are all the way back to the thirties. Like, no, well, that's way bigger. That's than a really. Had. That's a really interesting point, though, because like they started off being made by like the big Hollywood companies. And then there was a time when they started being made by people completely outside of that system. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's yeah, that is that's that's like a switch, which was in the 50s, which was like, hey, no, we're here to make these types of movies. Right. I'm sure these studios were like, we can we can kind of, you know, reap in on benefits. You know, if you think about it. Like in the article said, it was it was basically saying like, hey, we're not going to rent out all these expensive studios, that, you know, production production time at your guys' studios, MGM or or yeah. where whoever. We're going to do this on our own. That's going to reuse old footage. It's going to be a lot of outdoor filming, which I think is why like sci-fi kind of helped uh, lead the way um, with with some of these, and and we're going to do it like kind of on our own dime. The other thing is we're going to put these out incredibly fast, <laughs> yeah. you know, weekly at times, you know, and, um, and it's still a stepping, it was, it's still, it was still a stepping stool for, you know, lesser known actors to like get their break. You know, Clint Eastwood's an example of one who got his break on like B movies, Jennifer Aniston. We just saw her in the nineties with, uh, yeah. uh, Leprechaun, you know, so, it was still, it's still has this kind of the same characteristics, but it's just developed over the years. And I think the fifties, the eighties was a little gnarly, but also some of the better ones that came out in my opinion. So, yeah. And I feel like also it, at that point, it probably became a lot more competitive because it wasn't like, Oh yeah, we're just a movie company and we're going to make some, for our own purposes, make some additional films to fill up the theaters. It was anybody now basically can start a production company yeah. and try to sell these to us. And so I would think that, you know, if they're going for just what's going to get the maximum audience attention, it's almost, you've got these different movie makers who are in competition with each other to try and make a thing that will get people talking or keep people interested. Like the whole incentive structure changed a little bit mm-hmm. and that may be why we ended up seeing so many of you know like the exploitation films these really over the top like super gory or super graphic um type movies so it kind of makes sense to me that it would develop that way over time yeah and i think we saw sort of a similar 
type of thing when uh, everybody started getting VCRs. And then you had that like direct to video type thing where everybody could play in that market as well, which yeah. is a big part of, you know, what was going on in the early nineties. I think that also the idea of being a B movie is almost like its own subgenre now. Like it, it kind of has, I guess you would say like its own tropes and stuff. Like it feels like the, the idea of making a B horror movie in today's time, you have some like immediate associations with what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about movies like X and what are the ones that came along with it, they're almost like a doing their best imitation of like an old school, low budget horror movie. Yeah. Even though they have like more modern resources and technology. Does that make sense? Rejects? I mean, I think yeah, yeah, a absolutely. Lot of like Rob, Rob yeah. Zombie's style is, is similar to that. There's a lot of, there are a lot of directors where I feel like that's kind of like their style as well. And they're like, Oh, they're so original. And it's like, Whoa, 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 Whoa. Yeah. Right. You know, insert random director did this back in 82. And like, that was for sure influenced by this, but, um, yeah, I think it's, I it I feel like B movies be at least with horror like have have been like a wave almost like the highs of the thirties, lows of the forties, kind of highs of the fifties, back down and up. It, like it just kind of keeps going down and up, and then yeah. eventually kind of molded into what we kind of have now, which is like what we're calling like indie films, and the indie films is, is similar where it's like some indie films are similar where it's like, we don't have the biggest budget. So we got to like hide how we kill this person. Cause we don't have the CGI or the special effects to make them look like they're stabbed or whatever the case is. And it's just kind of molded into its own thing. So I can see why us as horror fans, just, I'm just going to say you and me, I won't say all our listeners are like, yeah, we're in for B horror movies most of the time. Yeah, and exactly what you were talking about is what we hope to see this season. Yeah. So we're going to start in the 1930s and kind of go decade by decade through the years and see how B-movies from that time have changed and how they've stayed the same and what's interesting about them and all that stuff. So I am really excited for this season and to just kind of like learn more about this part of the genre that we talk about all the time and to give it a chance to get some recognition, recognition, Maybe. recognition in an era where everybody's all hot and bothered about elevated horror movies. you damn right. And that's it for today's episode. If you've listened this far, then thank you. And we hope you've enjoyed it. We're always looking for new ideas. So if you have any questions, comments, or movie suggestions, please send us an email at the horrific pod at gmail.com or hit us up on the IG. That's what the kids call Instagram. Just search for The Horrific Podcast. Thanks for listening.